So I've decided to use this Pecha Kucha format uh, is quite a rigorous format. So I apologize in advance. There's going to be a little reading. It might sound a little contrived and forced, but I'm going to try and get through that and make it very clear and concise, and hopefully some interesting information will come across anyway. This is my first time doing a Pecha Kucha, so uh, be kind to me. <coughs> um, disclaimers out of the way. So, One World works at the intersection of technology and data to help people access the information they need to improve their lives and communities. We help local organizations and international organizations across the globe find ways to inform and engage communities more effectively. And for us, data is increasingly at the heart of almost everything we do, from real-time election monitoring to SMS-based counseling services. Oh. See, I've messed up already. So, <laughs> um, so we use data to inform our partners. Actually, there's a slide missing here, isn't there? Anyhow, forget it. Uh, we use data to inform our partners so they can make better decisions about how to serve their communities. And we use it to help us improve our own projects. So that gets back to what Tom was talking about. How can we learn in real time so that we don't have to say, we'll do it better next time. We can actually figure out how to improve something as we're going. But as a relatively small organization, we also know that one of the biggest impacts we can have is sharing our learnings with other people. Uh, so that's why I thank you, Jan, for inviting us here. Uh, I think it's great to have an opportunity to, to discuss with all of you today. So I'm going to start with a story from Senegal. Um, in 2012, the country's future was uncertain. The president was rapidly losing support, uh, but it seemed he was refusing to go quietly. So many people expected the opposition would win the election, but without rigorous polling, it was impossible to tell how much support either candidate really had. And there was concern that if the opposition did get more support and ended up getting more votes, the ruling party might manipulate the outcome. But if they did, would anybody even know? To protect the integrity of the process, civil society has been deploying election monitors across the country for nearly 20 years. <coughs> but their approaches, as you can see, were analog. Uh, observers would watch for key elements, like how a polling station is set up, how the vote is conducted, and they'd note everything down on these monitoring forms. At the end of the day, those forms would be sent to a local coordinator, who would send them to a regional coordinator. Ooh, Google Slides. Uh, who would eventually get them back to Dakar. Um, and then they would be entered into spreadsheets and ultimately analyzed. So despite having the manpower and the expertise, it might still be weeks or even months before civil society could say with any authority what happened on election day. But by then, the story has unfolded without them. Elections have been stolen or not. Protests have been mounted or not. And the world's attention has usually moved on to other countries. So we developed a system of codes that would enable the monitors to send their data in real time. A1 means the polling station opened on time. A2 means it didn't. C1 means the polling station was properly set up, but C2 means there's no proper ballot box, C3 means there are no privacy screens, and so on and so on. So while the process seemed a bit complicated, with a little training, the vast majority of observers mastered the codes quickly. And those who didn't master it were backed up by a data verification team in Dakar who contacted the observers anytime our system flagged up a message that seemed to be inaccurate. By 8 o'clock in the morning, we already knew which polling stations were having problems, and our partners were helping to get materials where they needed to be so that the voting could get started. Throughout the day, our partners had the information they needed to understand how the vote was being conducted on national, regional, and hyperlocal levels. They were able to fix problems before too many people were affected, and even notify local police to respond to incidents of vote buying and other illegal activities. On election night, our data already showed us that the president had lost, and by a fairly large margin, as you can see. With a margin like that, there's no way a candidate could realistically manipulate the results. And to his credit, President Wad did hand over power peacefully. But there's an interesting lesson to be learned from this data anyway. What you see here is that the data is the data from the representative sample of polling stations, which was chosen to match the demographics of the country as closely as possible. These are the results from a much larger, but randomly chosen set of polling stations. So while much of the data is more or less the same, you can see some important differences. 
look at Kolda and Kedugu here in the middle. Uh, when we look at this random sample of the polling stations, the results are too close to call in Kedugu, and it looks like Wad has lost in Kolda. But it, back in the representative sample, it looks like Wad probably won those two provinces. You see the difference here. So, of course, all of this is only true if the representative sample was actually representative within the province, which this wasn't. So in truth, the data was only rigor enough, rigorous enough to draw real conclusions at the national level. And even there, we still had a 3% margin of error. So my first piece of advice is to be smart and honest about your data. So data is always complicated. Uh, there are always biases hidden in the collection of data. Uh, we always suggest that uh, you consult data analysts from the beginning of a project uh, to make, and to make, that's really important to make sure that what you think you're seeing is really what it says. A lot of organizations say, oh, I'll go through this data, I'll check it out, I'll give this to an intern, and they'll tell us what it says. But actually the data is many times more complicated than that, and you have to really understand what it's telling you. So for example, if your sample has too many young people or too many old people, too many people with mobile phones, too many people who don't have mobile phones, uh, you might be drawing the wrong conclusions. If your data seems too good to be true or too bad to be true, it probably is. Uh, you should probably check it again. Uh, ask yourself if you might have messed up your data collection processes or your analysis somewhere, uh, and then double check it with your analysts again before you accept any surprising answers. I think a lot of times we sort of we see an answer that's really interesting and we're excited about it and so we brush forward with it. Uh, we always recommend double and triple check, especially those. Uh, secondly, if you can make your data set public, you should. That way others can analyze it end to end and believe in your conclusions. So we couldn't do this in Senegal because the law said only the constitutional court can publish election results. But had anyone challenged our results, we probably would have allowed them to see the data to prove its accuracy. Um, I know it's not, always uh, it's not always possible to publish data sets publicly, but when it is, it can help to legitimize your work and also to extend the impact of your work. Which takes me to my third point. Wherever you can, you should use categories and naming conventions that others are also using. We made the mistake of using different categories to tag questions coming in from Senegal, Morocco, and Nigeria and then couldn't go back and compare uh, our results very easily across countries. Uh, also, if you're using globally accepted categories, uh, that would have meant we could, um, we and others could have layered other global data sets on top of our data. Uh, so we could have used the global health and demographic surveys to compare what was happening in different regions of Senegal with what we were seeing from our results. But you can only do that if you've used the globally accepted categories. So recognizing that in advance and preparing your projects uh, in globally standardized formats can be extremely beneficial, both for you but also for others. It makes your, the, the value, uh, it multiplies the value of your, your data manifold. Um, so another thing to remember is that people can get in trouble for what they tell you. So our project in Egypt provides confidential answers to sexual and reproductive health questions. Imagine a young girl in Cairo asking about birth control options. That's an important question for her, but it could be dangerous if certain people found out she was asking it. In Myanmar and Cambodia, we piloted a service to let young people ask questions to their MPs by SMS and by Facebook. Politics and sexuality are two of the most sensitive topics in the world. For people to feel free to ask their questions, they have to know that nobody, not even the counselors or the MPs, will know who they are. So my last piece of advice is to always consider the privacy of your users. When necessary, we encrypt phone numbers and email addresses so health advisors, MPs, and even data clerks will never see them. And we often store data on servers in a third country. So even if a government official sees the project's computers, they wouldn't find any useful information. And finally, I want to leave you all with a question about privacy. It's something that I've been struggling with for a while. So the data we collect about the people who use our services can be extremely useful for us, for our users, for our partners, our donors, for everyone in the sector. It's great to be able to use it, and in some cases, to share it. But are all of our users really in a position to give informed consent for us to use their data? 
can someone who might not know what a database is really give permission for you to store their information? Can someone who's never used the web really understand the potential ramifications of allowing you to post their comments or post pictures of their children on your website? In a world where so many people use technology whose powers they don't fully understand, what responsibility to, do we, the data users, have to protect the identities and the data property of those who don't realize how much they might be giving away? Thank you. <laughs>